All right, thank you very much. Um, you guys can find the slides. I've shared them in the uh, in the files area, so they are there. Um, I'm gonna keep my, the chat up, so I should be able to see it. It's a relatively small crowd. We were going to. It's gonna have a breakout group, but I think if it stays this small, we all just kind of stay together. Um, so thank you very much. I, I appreciate everybody everybody being here. I'm excited to kind of share what we did and work through this. I've normally done this as a, more like a presentation, so this will be a little bit different. Um, but uh, so my name, well, let me find out where I am here. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my name is Mary Mathis Burnett. I'm at, uh, out of Watts College at ASU. Um, just real quickly, the, the timing here, again, be a little bit different. So uh, go through a quick background. Um, we'll spend 10 minutes kind of getting us on the same page. Um, and then we'll do the activity I had planned for the breakout group. We'll just kind of uh, probably merge that with all of us together. Um, and we had uh, set up time for, everybody, for the groups to come back and share. So that will just get by us a little bit more time in the end. Uh, and then I'll show you what we did with our framework and kind of wrap up um, from there. So uh, the first thing is I'm the manager of instructional design here. I'm a, a career instructional designer. So I've been in the field really for 15 ish, 20 years, I don't know, longer than I care to remember mostly. Um, I've always been in higher ed, though I've done some coursework for K-12 um, and, and that kind of thing as well. So um, that's kind of where I am. Now, where I got interested in critical pedagogy was realizing that after 15 or so years in higher ed, uh, when I bumped into it for the first time, I'd never even heard of it. And I, it was so frustrating for me that there's a theory like this that's so empowering. Um, and we just don't talk about it. Um, now, obviously, I have since found that people do talk about it, uh, but it's not widely uh, widely discussed. It's not widely used. And there are some reasons for that, right? And so I kind of wanted to look at what those reasons are. But I was also really unsatisfied with that. So I wanted to be able to create something um, or find something that would make it a little bit more broadly accessible. So the first thing I want to do is kind of get us um, like I said, get us on the same page here and sort of what is critical pedagogy and what do we do with it? And this is sort of what I was thinking um, as I started setting up the idea for uh, for the framework. Um, the first thing I wanted to do is start by asking the question about what higher education is. Um, I don't have an answer for that, really. I think it probably depends on where you are and what your perspective is. Um, what I do know is that in my experience, we're not what we aspire to be. Um, and it's really important for us to be able to recognize that. Systems theorists would say that the purpose of a system is what it does. Um, and what they're really acknowledging is, is that, well, what they're really saying is that they want us to acknowledge the practical reality of a situation or a system without regard for its intentions or design, right? We have a tendency to, uh, to say, well, I really wanted for it to do this thing, uh, but, but it's actually doing that thing. And if that thing is causing harm, we have to be able to see, accept, to see and accept that so that we can make adjustments, right? So if we divorce ourselves from the idea that it's meant to do this or it's meant to do that, we can look at what the system is actually doing. Now, applying that to higher education, who are we really? Um, the system that is higher education really is uh, continues to see enrollment growth. There's In, in the states, there's been a roughly 30% increase in the last 20 years. Online ed is growing at an even faster rate. When we start trending like that, especially in our capitalist systems, what we find is that we tend to start commodifying um, those things. We start treating education like a product. Students are as customers. Graduation rates is the primary measure of success. Um, and that's always been really frustrating to me. And the thing that has been maybe the most frustrating along the way is that as higher education institutions, we don't offer pedagogical training to our faculty, right? We hire folks who are experts in the field, um, practitioners, certainly people with a lot of value um, and a lot of knowledge and experience. But without pedagogical training, we get into these pedagogical loops because they don't necessarily know how to get out, right? So they do the thing that they were taught. Um, and that kind of thing is uh, just sort of stifles our progress in a lot of ways. And in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Freddie wrote, about the classroom specifically. And he said that he described it really as the, the banking model, transactional teaching, right? We've heard these words. And this is where teachers see students as empty vessels uh, to be filled with knowledge, right? There he said, knowledge is a gift to be bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing. 
um, the damage of that mindset really exists in the inherent dehumanization of students and, and it offers their perpetual existence in a state of ignorance, right? So Freddie wrote that keeping students in this state prevents them from growing their own consciousness. It keeps them in a mindset of past, being passive recipients of knowledge instead of active participants um, in the learning process. So when we get to this place where we lack pedagogical training and we exist in the power structures that create this transactional model, um, teaching changes. It, become, it becomes almost necessarily transactional. Um, technologists become investigators, teachers become judges and enforcers. Uh, retention and completion become synonymous with quality and somewhere in there we forget to worry about student learning and we end up fulfilling Freddie's criticism. So higher education has long been embedded in white male cisgendered heteronormative dominant culture, right? It's, that's become the status quo. That status is replicated in the classroom unless we make a conscious effort not to. Um, when we think about disrupting the status quo, we have to consider the reasons to do so because if we can't understand the situation um, and our reasons for disrupting, it's more difficult to do so, right? So we continue to see damage done by our white male patriarchy. We can continue to see damage done by individuals, our two individuals by our heteronormative mindset, we continue to see damage done by an unchecked dominant culture on those who are dominated, oppressed, and marginalized. And in the replication of the status quo, the damage done by the systems is also replicated. So critical pedagogy is asking us to wake up to the questions and problems and challenge the mindset that everything's okay as long as we're okay. Um, so it's a teaching approach really that's designed to um, undo the damage done by those systems that are already at play. Um, we want to be able to empower folks, students and teachers alike, to bring about the social changes they see that are needed. Um, now, if we think, start thinking about how are words defined, from whose perspective are we writing, whose perspective are we teaching, um, what is valued and prioritized, what assumptions are implicit, we have to examine the context of those questions uh, in the classroom because the classroom itself is not its own world, right? We don't exist in a vacuum. We're bringing all of those systems in and the classroom itself exists in the systems. The classroom is part of a program, part of a school, college, university, inside a wider institution, inside a society, you know, all of those things. And within every permutation, there exist decisions about classroom things. So if we reflect for just a second on the classroom as you know it, are we preparing students for the world they live in? Are we preparing them to be productive citizens? Are we reifying the oppressive systems of society? What is the system of higher education? From what viewpoint do we observe? Whose eyes are best situated to determine what higher education is doing and therefore is? And whose eyes are the ones doing the observation? Who gets to make those decisions? So critical pedagogy exists as a place where critical reflection and practice meet. So in action, it's fundamentally committed uh, to freeing the oppressed, abolishing class, transforming society, and making the argument that education is not value neutral, that it can't be. Education must, by necessity, either pacify students into accepting the version of reality that's offered to them or liberate them to understand and transform their own. And we in higher education can't ignore the ways that we sustain the norms and mechanisms of white supremacy and nationalism, heteronormativity, patriarchy, all of those dominant systems. We can't ignore the ways that we establish truth and knowledge when it disenfranchises individuals. And we owe it to students to model the paths to solutions and the ways that we behave. So to that end, Freddie coined the term conscientization, right? Which is the idea that people are becoming conscious of the world around them, um, the ways that society oppresses their natural freedoms and powers. Um, I'd say that one application of critical pedagogy is to discern and attend to those places where we've affected social agency, either denying it or producing it. Um, so the goal really is to pay attention here uh, to those spaces to become conscious of the way that we as a society are oppressing the natural freedoms and powers of people. So critical pedagogy is encouraging students and teachers to question the status quo and to look critically at the way things are and at who has the power. So we free ourselves from this transactional mindset and the method of teaching by working against the idea of depositing knowledge and becoming problem posers to encourage students to reflect experience and become agents in their own world. Um, this kind of thing can expose power structures that are at play, the systems in place, those systems work to silence some and amplify others. Um, let me ask you this. If you were to examine the materials in, in a course that you're teaching uh, for their authorship and perspective, 
whose voices are amplified, um, who is an authority in your classroom, and whose perspectives are disregarded, who's not included. And that single question can transform the way that you teach and the way that your students view the classroom. And I wanted to help faculty transform their teaching um, and their classrooms. And I couldn't find a tool that would help reach those faculty who lack pedagogical training and help them use critical pedagogy. Um, because I couldn't find one, um, we set about creating one. So this is what I see as the, the promise of, of this framework. My intentions here were clear. I wanted to improve the quality of uh, higher education courses. I wanted to inspire teachers and students to be able to practice change, freedom, and equity within the classroom and in the world um, or in their lives. And I wanted to be able to, I wanted to make sure to make critical pedagogy accessible to a wider audience, right? One of the uh, skepticisms that I bumped into when I started talking about the idea of the framework was that it's an advanced theory and we're asking folks to apply an advanced theory who don't have any theory uh, on wh which would support it. Um, that didn't feel like enough of a reason not to try it. So what I wanted was for the framework to become that. Right. So, so we worked in that way. So really quickly, let's do, let's take two minutes or so to do this quick poll. Um, so if you type in your browser or your device, links.asu.edu slash cp dash poll, it'll ask you these two questions. So I wanna think about as a group and sort of set our norm, uh, what are the priorities of critical pedagogy for you? And what would you need or expect from a framework for critical pedagogy? And Lee has posted it in the chat. So if you guys want to just click there, I'll, I'll pop up the um, results here too as they start coming in. Um, so we can see, I'd like to just take a couple minutes. Um, while we see those things and then we will, yeah, it's still uh, five or six folks. Okay, so yeah, we'll just do the, instead of doing the breakout room, we'll uh, collaborate on a single document. I always like seeing this stuff come in. Um, looks like empowerment is featuring really heavily centering marginalized experiences. Um, development of ethics, it's a very big one. Clicking in the wrong space here. There we go. And then see what we would need or expect. Social justice featuring very heavily too. I like that that's the first word on the screen there. Um, so care features uh, first in uh, what you would need or expect from a framework. Interesting. Um, yeah, so these are all things that, that did, well, these are not all things, I, I shouldn't say that. These are, some of these things did pop up for us when we went through this process. Um, but I always like to get a feel for where we are um, before we, we move forward. So just give that just another second and then we will um, bump back to the presentation. So what we're gonna do is, what we're gonna do as a group is start thinking about um, what you might wanna see, right? What you might expect to see, whether or not you want to, and what you might want to avoid seeing. Do you foresee any pitfalls to creating a framework like this? Um, things that people might jump into, right? So here we are thinking about, sorry about that. I turned off my text messages, but if you, if you should pretend you can't see my family texting me, that would be, Excellent. Um, so we're looking at we want instructions, we want multiple levels. Uh, I read that a little bit as uh, that multiple entry points also. So we want to make sure that we have, have tier. Maybe potentially the framework is going to meet uh, first year faculty versus experienced faculty. Um, that it should be accessible. Uh, ways address ways to or uh, specify ways to address inequity things like that. So um, so let's think about those things. Um, 
and then let me move us to the next one. So let's all go to the first one. I was prepared just in case. Um, so if we go to here, links.asu.edu uh, slash OER dash CPF1, that's going to take us to a shared Google document. Um, I'll also throw it up on the on the screen in a moment. But if you guys could nav there, uh, we can all kind of work together. In fact, would maybe I'll change my share. So I designed the document really to um, offer a variety of options, right? So we don't have to necessarily go through um, go through all this, but what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes, um, go through some introductions, uh, with, you know, put it in the document. This just helps with any attribution uh, for any any of these great ideas that come up, um, and then kind of go through what the priorities of critical pedagogy were for this group. We did that in the poll. Um, we can kind of address that more specifically and, and enhance that too, just part of the discussion. So, um, so. I'm going to uh, get quiet for a minute, and um, I'd like to hear from you guys and who you are. So don't feel like you have to participate, you have to talk. And let me share. Feel free if you're able to uh, open up your mics and and talk. But yeah, writing in the document. Um, there's only a, you know a handful of us, so I'm totally happy to have everybody chatting. Okay, so I'm going to try to break the ice. I am Benjamin from Halle Wittenberg in Germany. Um, I'm a project leader of a project that um, engages in empowering students um, in teacher education so that they are all teachers are going to be teachers and we're trying to teach them how to employ digital technologies and I think one of the biggest challenges of what you mentioned uh, or we're elaborating is how can you teach students to navigate through all those different systems and through all those different kinds of um, like pedagogical frameworks that are already inscribed in all those different systems they are using like um, course material that is prepared by publishers or also like software they are using so i think that would be one of the angles that is particularly interesting for me That's very cool. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Google approaches. Okay. 
That's very resonant, Benjamin. I'm Joe Murphy. I'm uh, the director of the Center for Innovative Pedagogy at Kenyon College, which most people would call a teaching and learning center. Um, we're a very small school, so we've got both a lot of flexibility in what we can empower people to use and a lot of uh, difficulty helping them make those choices. So everything Benjamin just said resonates. Okay, I'm happy to, uh, oh, Kevin, I don't know if you're muted. Looks like you're talking, but I can't hear you. I can try to jump in. Can you hear me? Well, Catherine's working on her mic. Okay. You can hear me, but you can't see me. It doesn't, this doesn't like my video for some reason. <laughs> so I'm um, Lee Graves Wolf. I am a clinical associate faculty at Arizona State University and happened to be Mary's dissertation chair as well. Um, but I live in Michigan and um, we're I'm very interested, not just because I was Mary's chair, but in the framework that she developed as we continue to revise our curriculum um, in our educational doctorate program. Um, I think that the, the tool and the questions and the process that um, she'll be leading us through has been really helpful for me as I continue to consider um, the what I see never ending process uh, in a good way of curriculum revision and refinement. Agreed there. Will I, will I try again? Yeah, I can hear you now. That's good. Okay, great. Hi, Mary. It's uh, it's nice to see you. Uh, I was just very excited to hear about your work and looking forward to hearing more. Um, I, I have a background in critical approaches to digital and open education and did my PhD around critical approaches to open educational practices and now I'm working kind of at a higher education sectoral level and so there are challenges there of course just like you said about um, you know how to support um, people where they are uh, and kind of nurture these these critical approaches and acknowledging context and so on so um, yeah looking forward to, to discussion and about your framework. Awesome. Um, this is has has been a really exciting opportunity for for me going through this. Um, I was really surprised that they, something like this didn't already exist, um, and then I started doing it, and I thought, oh, that's why it doesn't exist yet. Um, it's you know it's difficult, and um, and so I don't know if if, uh, if anyone else wants to to jump in. I, I'd love to hear from everybody, um, but we can also move forward and. Um, into kind of what we think the priorities might be. So if you were to sort of settle into your top three to five priorities of critical pedagogy um, in the classroom, uh, if, if, if I told you this class is using critical pedagogy, what are the top three to five things you would expect to see um, in, that, in that classroom? I know that's difficult. Um, we just start throwing them, throwing them out there and but not random, it's important. Mm. I like that idea of flattening the perceptions of students. I, mean, I don't like the idea, but I like the, the wording, I guess. Um, Uh, 
Um, so I also want to kind of expand on some of these things as we as we go. So when we start thinking about involving students in as many processes and decisions as possible, um, that's a that can be a sticking point for a lot of faculty, right? So um, sometimes, particularly in online courses, um, well, I, I shouldn't say that. I see particularly here, we have Arizona State is a large school. Um, we have a lot of very large classes. And what that tends to mean is that the classes come sort of prepackaged. Um, and, and we hand those online courses to faculty, and then the faculty make, are able to um, move in those courses as they see fit. But uh, uh, that stuff is there. And it varies. Their level of freedom to make those changes varies by um, unit, right? So in our college, um, they can do whatever they want. They don't even have to use those prepackaged courses if they don't want to. It's just an opportunity for us to uh, take some of their burden off. Uh, because most of the time they're still currently working in the field. So we're asking a lot of them to also do instructional design. When we start thinking about full-time faculty who are no longer working in the field, um, or not that they always are, but um, in any case, when we start talking about those who are able to devote more time, um, that can sometimes change uh, the, the way. So when we start thinking about involving students in processes and decisions, what might that look like in some of your courses? Are you able to, are students able to affect the syllabus? Are they able to affect text choices or objectives, course objectives, learning objectives, or are those things um, provided? Also very true. Joe, there's a, Joe's put in the chat, just in case you guys can't see it. Uh, there's a burden on students. Um, we're seeing a fair number of students who are overwhelmed by the number of choices they're given. And that's an extremely fair, uh, fair point. So there's a there's a, the idea that came up for us was the idea of contained freedom. Yeah, so you you offer the boundaries and you say do whatever you want kind of within these boundaries, um, and that can help with those who face decision paralysis or um, anxiety with too many choices and not knowing where to start. Ungrading also um, can be difficult. Is someone going to jump in? So um, one of our faculty here um, has done ungrading in uh, doctoral level courses. And she's done it. What she found was that they very often uh, pushed back. They didn't want ungrading. And I, I um, thought that was interesting at the time, and then I realized I was the same way when I first started my doctoral program because I just sometimes you just need to know that you're doing the right thing, and what we've established as a system is grading as one of those uh, opportunities to affirm. So if we can change that, um, we have to also change each other and change ourselves, and that's difficult for for folks. So uh, so that one is is a super good. I love ungrading. Um, but you, I hear a lot of people are really nervous about, about trying it out. Let's see, focusing on accessibility, totally agree. Uh, design choices matter in that. Um, variety of perspectives and voices, choosing their own paths through the course. That's really interesting. So now we have a kind of um, choose your own adventure uh, type deal. So maybe perhaps there are tracks. Um, these are things that can come up that are relatively simple, but also require a great deal of work uh, up front. Um, that's the thing that I think a lot of a lot of folks miss in instructional design, is um, is that we uh, there's all that upfront work that we have to do too. And feel free if you guys want to chat this out. You don't want to just listen to me narrating. <laughs> Happy to listen to you too. I have a question on the pushback uh, on ungrading. Was this happening sure. uh, within a certain course, or was it the ungrading within a whole curriculum? Oh no, um, certainly not a whole curriculum. Not not mm. uh, not here. But in this in this course, um, we've we're, I've pitched. I I keep trying to get people to uh, move away from grades, but it is fairly radical, as I've discovered. So. Um, what she said specifically is she likes to take it out of the doctoral programs, um, mm -hmm. but they, they're they like, how, how am I going to know how I did? And she's like, well, I'm going to give you feedback, but 
that's how you're going to know. Uh, but they, they need a, an actual gray, they need a number on it, and they rest it a little bit more easily. And I, I thought, um, so for, for her, it was just that one class. And um, I, uh, I, took, I did some doctoral coursework many years ago before I, I finally came back to ASU and finished up. And during that program, we had a, uh, a course that was a little bit of a, uh, a loose ungrade. It was, he was, his was also very loose. Um, uh, but he also did an ungrading thing, and, and it was really uncomfortable for us. So I can sympathize. The, the system is powerful, um, but what do we do in the meantime? So um, do we, are we finished here with priorities? Do we want to uh, talk these out? There's a bunch of them here. Um, and I think this is okay. So one of the things is about critical pedagogy is that it's – subjective and individual, right? That was another one of the skepticisms that came my way about building a framework is you, you, to frame it is to limit it. And every application of critical pedagogy is individual. And so I think that's, that's true in a lot of ways. Um, but I also think that there are some very basic premises that we can use. And uh, if, it's, if the framework is flexible enough, we could potentially you know, move forward from there. So. Um, yeah, you guys are hitting on a lot of the stuff we hit on. Um, some of my faculty hit on too when we went through this, um, supporting faculty and staff. Um, yeah, changing institutional policies. That's a big, that's a pretty big lift for us here at ASU. I don't know, I don't know if every uh, institution is uh, embroiled in as much red tape as we are, but, but we are. Um, Yeah, that seems about right. So, um, so if we if we take this then the, these ideas of what the priorities are, and then we move into the purpose um, of, of the framework. So think about these priorities, and if we were to keep these priorities in mind and build a critical framework, a critical pedagogy framework to accomplish them, what might that, what might the ultimate, the larger purpose of this thing be? Um, what might we expect it to do? And if that's unclear, let me know because I spent a lot of time clarifying that in our group too. Yeah, Lee, for sure. Um, is it back you up? Uh, that was one of the things that came up too, because faculty put in a lot of effort um, into courses in general, course design. That's that's true of online courses. That's true of face-to-face -face courses. And we often don't get credit for that labor uh, that goes into it. And so one of the things is potentially a framework like this could offer some support uh, to say, I did all these things. I, I went through this. Uh, and made that work. And if we could make it so that that was presentable um, in your own 360 review or whatever, uh, that's something that, that's interesting too. So supporting new and experienced faculty and staff. Legible to students, yeah. Interesting. OK, so, so when you say legible to students, uh, I think that was anonymous buffalo. Uh, something that helps students see their own work in critically oriented classes. So um, that's a really big deal. That's a tough. Go ahead. Well, one of the things that we have run into is students who m know that they are having good experience in classes using critical pedagogy, but feel that they are not respected by their colleagues because they should be taking a tough course with lots of high stakes exams. And I think sure. get, equipping the students with the language to say, no, this is highly meaningful intellectual work that we do, we do not come to class and join hands and sing Kumbaya is a, an important 
component of helping them articulate their own journey, I think. I agree. Um, I agree a lot. There's a big perception in the, the sort of softness of not grading and that, that grading automatically means rigor. Um, and and those are those are challenging mindsets, uh, you know, across the educational journey. That's that's something that is uh, features very large. And so so I totally agree. That was that is a new one because what we when I've heard legible to students and what I initially thought when I read that was that um, it's still course focused, so that students can apply feedback to the courses. But when you look instead at allowing them to see their own work. Um, and offering the language so that they can become self-advocates uh, in, in a more efficient way. I think that's that's a, that's a really big deal. Okay. Different discipline areas, um, totally agree. And for learners to leave the course feeling empowered and controlled. And see, that is uh, fundamentally critical pedagogy right there. So um, I, I would think this one would be hard pressed to find any framework for critical pedagogy uh, that did not have this in there. I, I think that's. Um, it's got, yeah, been respect also. And Jesse Stommel says, you know, start with trusting students. Um, and remember that they're human before they're anything else, right? And so they have a lot going on, um, things that we're not aware of, and really, frankly, are none of our business. And so um, uh, they have this whole world. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do, you guys keep typing, like to um, keep going. I want to also start moving into what the form of the framework might be. So we start thinking about this in terms of um, what is it going to look like? How are we going to use it? Is it going to be online? Is it going to be written? Is it going to be part of the, um, an oral presentation? Is it going to, you know, what what kind of thing um, would you expect for something like this to be? Or need? What do, I mean, what do you think it needs to be? This one's always tricky. This is where it hits the uh, it hits the ground, so to speak. Yeah, so it's okay, yeah, something physical, something that you can actually see uh, or work with. Um, being explicit about the grounding values is something that's important, and I think that is dependent upon the unit that's using the framework, um, because each unit may have different grounding values. If you're looking at an engineering program using a framework like this versus uh, a writing program, the grounding values and principles may be different. Um, and that's just even in a single college, a single university. So when we start getting into a research one school like like ASU or uh, a small private school, um, those things you know can change. The grounding principles can change, and so so I think um, it would need to be. That's probably an area of flexibility um, for a framework. Uh, let's see, format that works well for groups. Yeah, this I think, uh, my thought here was a community of practice um, surrounding the, the framework there. Um, we were not able to implement that in, in mind. That was mostly, you know, COVID. COVID messed everything up for a lot of people. So um, personal teaching philosophy, yeah. So how does a personal teaching philosophy enter into a framework like this? 
um, a matrix approach. And make one change practice. That's really interesting. Um, do kind of one thing at a time. Um, ACE framework, yeah. I agree. Um, that's different. And that's that's one that uh, that I looked at when we were building because I because this was my dissertation research. So what I did was created a committee, uh, and then I did the the actual work uh, of instructional design with doing this too. So. Yeah, agreed there too. Um, this big, uh, we have a lot of pseudo conflicts. Um, okay, so um, thinking about it like this, so we also have um, what we want is for it to take some shape, right? We don't want it to necessarily be uh, abstract or sort of in the ether. We want to be able to, um, you know, kind of move with it, do something with it. I think that's that's also in there. Uh, oh, good. A link. Uh, I'll check that out too. And you guys keep the keep the document too, because there's a lot of really good ideas in here. Um, and so now, if we were to build the framework, what might that? We just have. I just want to spend a couple minutes on here, and then I want to wrap. Um, go back, and I'll show you quickly what we did, and tell you about what our process was, which is a little bit a little bit of this, but this is very. <laughs> Yeah, we uh, we did this in a, a more than 20 minutes, so um, <laughs> so it was a, we had a slight advantage over you guys. Uh, and this one is also tricky, so it, it's it's kind of the form question too. So if we, I'm happy to, if you just want to move on, we can also do that. I don't know if, if we have different ideas for this or uh, if this is a, a bigger lift. Looks like a bigger lift. So, um, if you guys want to keep keep writing in here, please do. I'm going to move back um, to the presentation here, and I'll show you what we did. Okay. So I took three theories of critical pedagogy, um, actor network theory, and social network theory. And the reason I picked those three is because they really worked well together. Critical pedagogy is saying you gotta uh, encourage students to be agents. Actor network theory is saying that knowledge itself is not inherently powerful. It can be enacted or realized in multiple forms. Um, and knowledge and truth are ascribed actually by a network through the process, right? So there's a lot of uh, philosophy around that, but actor network theory is just saying like, we all just decide what truth is and we decide together. Um, social network theory looks at the way that people in a given group move and work together uh, and that how that affects the flow of information and power. Okay, so together, critical pedagogy is seeking to liberate and empower the marginalized while calling for educators to engage. Um, social network theory is examining all players in a given group, their connections to each other in the outside world, its low of knowledge, power, and material. And actor network theory is examining all players, including their complex social lives um, and experiences, the way knowledge is accepted and power is given. Right? So we're really doing big looks at power uh, for this, and I think you know, for me, it was really important um, not to disregard um, the idea of power dynamics in higher ed because they are prolific. Uh, so here's what I did. So two phases. Phase one, um, we gathered some information. I did surveys, interviews. Uh, we used Slack a little. Did some uh, follow-up survey because we only used Slack a little. Um, and then we did committee meetings where we actually built the framework. And once that was together, we initiated phase two, where we tried it out to see um, whether or not it worked. So in the surveys, we uh, primarily was focused on, do you know anything about critical pedagogy? What, what do you want to see in the online classroom? So what, what they across the board, this included faculty, staff, and students, they wanted to see improved student-to-student -student connection. They wanted to see uh, building of community. They wanted to see improved student and instructor connection um, to so they could increase engagement. They wanted more reflection and critical thinking. That's 
uh, pretty obviously, mostly faculty. And they wanted more intentional course design. And that looked a little bit different from faculty and students, but it kind of ultimately landed there. We wanted to look at um, clear course navigation, thoughtful textbook choices, things like that. Um, from there, I did interviews from those who were uh, willing to keep participating and um, did a whole bunch of coding and came up with essentially these three themes, which are how we treat our students. That's vague as, uh, as themes go, but it basically comes down to considering and prioritizing human interaction, considering the student experience, and protecting and producing student agency, power, and freedom, right? So rather than, than sort of shutting down, we want to actually open that up a little bit more. Um, they were, there was really an underlying intention in a lot of those to acknowledge and honor the full humanity in each individual member of the course community, not just students. So we all have a lot going on. Um, this was at the very start of COVID when we did, when we did these, um, uh, these interviews, or right before the shutdown, I think. Um, and so it was, so that's kind of what we just all want to see is we all have a lot going on. Let's just acknowledge that. Um, and then uh, what the course should look like, again, clear intentional course design. This is um, uh, creating space. The, one of the things that featured really heavily was creating space within the structure and function of a course that can accommodate or enhance student ownership experience, agency, and power. Um, that really couldn't be overstated. It kept kind of popping up in all the interviews. Um, and one of the students suggested really that she wanted to be able to give feedback um, uh, on courses. And we don't always have a clear mechanism for that. Even if we do end of course surveys, um, students don't always know where that stuff goes. Uh, and then the, the uh, third theme is what the framework should be. So that really came to building the framework and then also thinking about critical pedagogy. So we did that in the Google document, we kind of did both. Um, and, uh, and we moved from there. So Slack was designed to remove the institutional roles and therefore sort of neutralize the power dynamics so that students and tenured faculty and non-tenured faculty and adjuncts and staff members could all be in there. And even if they knew each other, they wouldn't be aware of who was talking and how much power they had. Um, so they could have these anonymized conversations. Um, and it was a, a higher technical lift, heavier technical lift than I really thought that it would be. So I still think it's, a, it's worthy of uh, being part of the process, uh, but I would prepare for that a little better than I did. I didn't do quite enough scaffolding, so I would do that. Plus, I would, all of my people were, um, you know, directors and program managers and stuff, and they were just very, very busy. So we didn't get as much interaction there. Uh, because we didn't get as much, what I wanted to do was have them come to agreement about the priorities of critical pedagogy, and then um, from there move into creating the framework. Uh, with the committee. Because we didn't, I did a follow-up survey um, and had them rank. So I, I culled from the interviews and got 21, I think, characteristics of, uh, of a critical pedagogy class. And then I had them rank them 0 to 10 on importance. And uh, then I took anything that landed above a 9. So there was actually more, dis more variation in there than I thought there was going to be. And where they landed was their top course characteristics would be a highly engaged faculty or instructor faculty instructor self-awareness, that one was very, very important to, the, to our group, a highly participative environment, acknowledging the student experience and expertise, critically examining self, faculty and students alike, um, flexibility and adaptability, and acknowledging the power structures in the classroom. You can't deal with something that we used to acknowledge, right? So, so, so those are the, kind of the, the broad-ish themes that we wanted to move forward with. Um, so here's what we did. We got together as a committee. Uh, the committee, my student participants dropped out before we got to the committee, um, but we were able to do faculty and staff in here. And so what I did was put this up on the screen and then I talked through uh, the same stuff we just did in that Google document. What is the purpose of this thing? And our people wanted it to be able to advocate for faculty effort and energy. They wanted to create a means for appropriate faculty evaluation because a lot of places don't have that yet. Um, we wanted to disclaim that it is expected for this to be difficult. You should encounter turbulence. Um, so don't let that just, you know, put you off of it. It's going to happen and you got to just kind of tough it out, right? Thick skin for critical pedagogy. Um, I also wanted to consider the audience. So we started out doing online faculty. We, we moved to include remote um, once everything went haywire. Um, and I also make, would make the argument that the final product uh, 
is useful face to face. K-12 is useful for everyone. Uh, we wanted to promote good pedagogy and to provide an incentive with ad, with administrative support, right? So features, we wanted it to be a decision tree, so it had to be question based, it needed to have levels or tiers of application or levels of entry. Um, scaffolding for new users so we could meet them where they are, regardless of where they are in their pedagogical um, training. Uh, we wanted it to include soft skills, offer a community of practice, acknowledge the existing system, the modality, other mitigating factors, right? So we have large, large classes, and then if you have a class of three versus a class of 300, uh, those are different and should look different. Um, acknowledge the lack of training, promote connection, laying out various tools, that kind of thing. And the function it needed to guide new and experienced faculty, it needed to take people through a critical process, uh, it needed to teach them how to make difficult decisions. Um, and then the form, it should be decision tree, flexible, some kind of sliding scale or contingent path. So I took all of that and uh, I started building it. And then I realized I had a bunch more questions. So we talked about those things. I'm just going to move quickly here. Um, and so I used Twine, which if you're not familiar, is a browser-based interactive storytelling tool. Um, made it easy to build and kind of move through. It has some drawbacks, like I haven't been able to get it to produce a document. Um, I haven't been able to, so you, so you could like print the final page, but I don't know why I didn't include a print button. It just uh, it was totally oversight. So, so all of this happened over a two week period for me. So we moved very quickly through. And what we ultimately landed on, as you can see, um, sorry, uh, they enter here. Um, and then they have this option where they can go on the side so they can learn what is critical pedagogy and what, what are we even doing here? What is this tool that I'm using? They, we landed in four categories, discussions, assessment, materials, and engagement. And then each category had um, you know, six or seven criteria. And so they moved through those. And so this is just kind of the layout. And then they got results. Um, so here's what it ultimately looked like. Um, so it gives them a quick overview, and then they can choose if they want to um, review discussions, assessments, course materials, or the connection and engagement. Then they can get some help if they need it. Um, and so if they need to understand critical pedagogy, we supplied some resources. These are all videos um, that are relatively short and give them a brief overview, and they can choose what kind of video they want. Um, if they review, this is what it looks like. So the trust building, so it's going to say, pay one important characteristic is that we need to do deliberate trust building. Um, here's why it's important. Uh, so do the discussions in this course promote trust building? So they can either go ahead and rate it or they can um, click to learn how. Like if they, I don't know how to identify this. So um, if they do, then they could say, hey, this is what it might look like. Uh, you might see, might offer an easy win. They might offer a chance for students to see the facilitator and each other as more than names on the screen, synchronous meetings, that kind of thing. Um, so it just guides them through, provides some scaffolding. So if they already know, they can just move through. Uh, and then they get results. So the, um, the results here, I chose not, not to use numbers because that just didn't seem very critical pedagogy -y. Um, I'm not totally satisfied with the labels, making an effort, missing the mark, but uh, it was the best they could do in the in the time. And so once they get their results, they get an individual category result, so discussion and participation results, and then they get an overall result. Uh, and for each one, then they get these resources, uh, which expand um, to offer some context and then uh, and information. So that's kind of how the whole thing works. Um, so in the post review, they said they really liked it, mostly positive. Uh, they said it returned results that accurately represented their own understanding of the course. They were more familiar with critical pedagogy by the, after they used it and more likely to use it in the future. And then um, they offered some use for improvements, visually repetitive, more resources, more examples. Um, some of them struggled to use it, some of them did not, but they all did figure it out. So, um, here, so here's where you can get more information, um, critpedframework.com will get you everything. We are continuing to do research. We're continuing to draw information and feedback so that we can create a second version that's more flexible and easier to use than Twine. Um, you can email me directly, or you can go to links.asu.edu and um, uh, see, 
slash cpf dash info and that can a quick google doc that'll get you on my uh, on my list so i'm going to go ahead and stop share i think we have maybe one minute or something but uh okay so benjamin i see your question in the in the chat which is uh they've been anonymized in slack or was it a matter of flat communication they were actually anonymized i created an outside of asu slack workspace and invited and created a bunch of throwaway emails and then assigned them passwords and handed them out so there were no names involved um, in there so it was uh you know with a little bit more information a little bit more scaffolding it would have been um uh, a more successful i think but it was uh, still very good so uh, so definitely you know hit the website email me directly if you'd like and um and let me know if you have any questions i'm happy to answer it's also very flexible so uh, go ahead if, if you have a question i think i heard just to kind of process question mary i just i mean i'm thinking yeah. as you were going through the last few minutes there of some people who might be interested in this so this is openly available and free to share is that correct Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the Creative Commons, um, and it's it's on the website. So the website also has download instructions. So the current framework you can download as an HTML file, upload in Twine, and make any adjustments. There's a a Google document that I've put together that has those resources. So I would go to that Google document, and then um, and if you need if you can't find it, I, I think it's clear. But if you can't find it, just shoot me an email, and I'll get you everything you need. Fantastic. Well, I'm really looking forward to digging in a little bit more. I'm really impressed with what you managed to pull together from that diverse set of requirements and wish lists of people. Um, but and I'll definitely share it as well. Awesome. Thank you. I uh, it was really it was a good time for me. I'm I'm uh, I'm pleased with it and and uh, excited to move forward with it too. I think we, we're uh, right at the hour mark. So thank you, everybody, for joining. And I uh, appreciate your time and attention and participation. This was very cool. Thank you for joining, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording now.